Good evening. If I'm unrecognisable, my name is Craig. I often serve here. Click. Thank you. Appreciate that. If I felt the urge to cause embarrassment to someone, I would let you all know that this is in honour of my mother-in-law, who is here this evening. And of course, it's the festive season, so it just felt, uh, it felt right. Uh, I've been away with my wife in Texas for a couple of weeks, so it really is a delight to be back with our family of faith. We're going to continue our reading in Luke's Gospel. In fact, if you have a Bible nearby or you've got some kind of digital device, you want to pull up Luke chapter 2. We're going to continue our reading from verse 8 all the way through to verse 20, and then we're going to spend a few minutes camped out in this passage and see what God might speak to us through his inerrant and inspired word. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find him, a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Verse 16, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told to them. A particular Puritan writer, Isaac Ambrosi, once wrote this regarding the birth of Christ the Lord. The birth of Christ is the comfort of all comforts. It's the sweetest balm that there ever was. And we have the privilege this year at the end of 2021 and and every year in our calendar to set aside some time just to break away from the hectic busyness of life as as Pastor Jacob spoke about, to dedicate some time to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Now in the story that we've read this evening, there are many characters that we could kind of dial in and zero in and focus on. We've seen shepherds and we've seen angels and of course Mary and Joseph feature fairly prominently. There's, there's the unnamed but yet somewhat vaguely referenced. There's an innkeeper. There's all different kinds of characters. Even political rulers. Quirinius is named. And of course at, the, at the, the center of the Roman Empire there is Caesar Augustus. We're going to spend a little bit of time here this evening just focusing our attention on something of a contrast. Here is Christ being born in the lowly manger And here is Caesar on his imperial throne. In fact, it was Caesar Augustus that took the the Roman Empire, as it's now known, from its its fairly rural republic into the, the behemoth which ruled a third of the entire world's population. How does Caesar contrast with Jesus Christ. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1, in our reading today, we, we read this, and it came to pass in those days that they went at a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. We might simply call that a, a census. Caesar wants to know how many, predominantly, this is really his motivation, how many taxpayers do I have? How much revenue can I, can, can, can I expect from the subjects of my, of my rule and my empire? And in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, the inspired author wrote this, For there is born to you, this is the words of the angels to the shepherds, or the angel to the shepherd, in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
There is something of an unspoken juxtaposition in this reading. And in fact, every Christmas season between the greatest ruler the world had known up until that point, the Caesars of the empire, and this lowly king, the one that they will call king of kings, or in the words of the angel to the shepherds, Christ the Lord. Christ, we know, is a technical term in Bible times to mean the anointed of God, the one that God has set apart, the one that God has put his unique seal on. And this Christ is, of course, Lord. Both of these personalities in our story, Caesar Augustus and Jesus Christ, have annual celebrations. Christmas, of course, we're celebrating the the birth of Jesus Christ, and and Easter is a time where we remember and celebrate the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. But the month of August, you may know, you may not know, is dedicated, named after this particular Caesar Augustus. So who were they? Briefly this morning, uh, this evening, that's a habit of mine because we have a morning service here at Journey, so when I stand here and look out at all you beautiful faces, it's so natural for me to say, morning, please forgive me. Caesar was the most powerful, the most powerful man in the world's most powerful empire. He sat at the top, he ruled. He was was what history knows as an absolute despot. That means that at simply the whim of his word or his inclination, anyone's life could just be snuffed out At the click of his fingers, or if you like, in the romantic nature, we speak about the the Roman Caesars from a thumbs up to, of course, you all know, a thumbs down. He ruled with his imperial reign, with his dominance and absolute despotism. The reality is the world, the entire history of humanity had not yet known an empire as powerful, as vast, as supreme, as all-encompassing as what emerged as the Roman Empire, particularly under Caesar Augustus. The man at top of this mountain, who's also known as Octavian, you historians out there may want to know, he was also known as Octavian, he ruled. An empire that spread a mind-boggling 2.3 square million square miles, encompassing three continents, and as I said earlier, almost a third of the entire world's population were under the rule of Caesar. What Caesar wanted, Caesar got. What Caesar desired, Caesar achieved. And here is the edict that we read in our story today. He wants to know numerically how many subjects are in, under his rule. May they, may they go to their hometowns of their, of their lineage and from that point may they register as subjects of the empire. Here is Jesus. What a contrast we see. In fact, Jesus is in Bethlehem, partly as we read in the story, because Caesar has issued this imperial decree, and partly, if not predominantly, because the Old Testament book of Micah has in fact prophesied that Messiah shall come from Bethlehem. We know that Jesus is born to Teenage parents who lived under the crippling scandal. Mary visited by an angel. The angel told Mary, you shall, you shall bear a son before you've known a man. In your virginity, you shall become pregnant and you shall bear the very son of God. That kind of a crippling scandal followed these teenage parents. Some have suggested that's part of the reason why They're alone in their journey to Bethlehem. Where are the rest of the family? There seems to be something of an abandonment here. We know that after spending time in Bethlehem, they rented a house. They fled to Egypt to escape Herod's infanticidal rage. We'll look at that more on Sunday. And then they returned to Nazareth, this tiny little town of Nazareth. In fact, it was was proverbial in this day and age to... To say a phrase, many of you read your Bibles, you know the phrase, can anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? Many of you can think of a a small town or, or village or even a small city where that phrase might even apply in our modern day. That was Nazareth. We know that Nazareth had one well. We can tell that from history and archaeological digs and even the town that still lies today in this part of 
of the Middle East. It sustained about a couple of dozen, maybe a hundred people. We're looking at the childhood of Jesus in this tiny little home that was probably no bigger than the parking space that you rolled your car into this evening. He was born into a rural peasant family. Jesus never married, never traveled more than a few hundred miles from home. He was never properly educated, never went to college or got a degree or got a GED or anything remotely resembling that. He never chaired a company or accrued much money, never authored any book, never owned any property or even a house, never achieved political office or ran any kind of political campaign. He never won, let alone fought in any war. He spent roughly 90% of his life in obscurity, working in a small peasant carpenter shop with his dad. The three years of his public ministry, which occupy the majority of literature in the Gospels of the New Testament of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those three years, as we can read and observe, were riddled with harassment, slander, vicious attacks, trying to paint him as a harlot-born, demon-possessed alcoholic. That was the rumor that constantly spread. We saw this last Sunday that I preached, in fact, two Sundays ago. Even as Jesus was in his early 30s and he was preaching, his detractors would say, hey, Jesus, we know who our dad was, and leave the slander to hang in the air to accuse him of illegitimacy. For all intents and purposes, this three-year ministry career of Jesus was cut short. So so it would seem from from an outward worldly perspective in the predictable tragedy of Roman crucifixion. The Romans did to Jesus what they always did, what they were most proficient at doing, and that was eradicate the life, silence the radical. So for this Jesus who had no electricity, no media, no social media, no public relation firm, no offspring, no money, no power, no soldiers, not even a business card to his name. This Jesus Christ has somehow become the most towering figure in all of human history. It begs the question, right? How is this even remotely possible? Christian and non-Christian alike cannot study or observe or understand anything about history without getting a sense of the magnitude of this Jesus who on that first Christmas is lying in a feeding trough. The staggering nature of this contrast. Caesar, all the power in the world. Jesus, seemingly the most insignificant and powerless person in history. Staggeringly, Jesus accomplished all that he accomplished, what's recorded in scriptures in three years of itinerant ministry, walking around, preaching mainly to rural people, predominantly illiterate people who repeatedly misunderstood him. H.G. Wells, an historian entirely unsympathetic to Christianity, you know anything about H.G. Wells? He said, no one can write a history of the human race without giving first and foremost place to the penniless teacher of Nazareth. It occurred to those who formulate even our English language to call the recording of the events past as his story. This is Jesus Christ. What is the true value of the man of Jesus Christ? Historian Philip Schaff I will say, was very sympathetic to Christianity. He is quoted as saying, Jesus has set more pens in motion and furnished more themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, works of art, learned volumes, sweet songs of praise than the whole army of great men in ancient or modern times. More songs, more books, more poems are written about Jesus even still today than any other single person. One member of the American Antiquarian Society and historian, W.E.H. Lecky, said this, the character of Jesus has not only been the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive in its practice, as he has exerted so deep an influence 
that it may be truly said that the simple record of three years of active life has done more to regenerate and to soften mankind than all the distinguished philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. Let me give you one more because I know most of you do tire of the historic embedded messages that I am just committed to preaching. I'll give you two more. Can we do two? I said one, but I just felt, hey, hey, I got you laughing, I got you in a good mood, it's Christmas. Napoleon Bonaparte admitted this, that Jesus greatly surpassed his own conquest. And these are Napoleon's own words. Let me read you these. He said, I know men. I know men. I tell you that Jesus Christ is not a man. Of course, he's overstating it. Bonaparte went on and said, superficial minds will see a resemblance between Christ and the founders of empires and the gods of other religions. But that resemblance does not exist. There is between Christianity and whatever other religions, the distance of infinity. The religion of Jesus is a revelation from an intelligence which is not of man. Bonaparte went on and said this, Alexander, the Greek conqueror, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself, we all founded empires. But upon what foundation did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. But this Jesus founded his empire upon love. And Napoleon said this, at this very hour, he said, There are millions of men who would in an instant die for him if given the chance. Napoleon was staggered by this as he constantly tried to generate a force to build his armies and conquer more of Europe and yet he found that when he reflected upon Jesus, Jesus didn't have to beg or pay and buy or plead with people to follow him and buy into his vision because Jesus is the greatest person In history. Surveying the record of human life on this planet, historian Kenneth Scott, who was a Nobel laureate, he said this Jesus is the most influential life that has ever lived on planet Earth. So, reflecting upon all that, because here's our advantage as each Christmas comes and goes, and we reflect on the Christmas story, part of us thinks, well, it would have been kind of nice to be there. I mean, we talk about it, we, we read the narrative of it in the Bible, we, we read stories, we sing songs and Christmas carols, and, and there are times where we think, I'd like to have seen it, I'd like to have reflected on it in the first person. But the one advantage that we have, that the shepherds didn't have, that even the angels didn't have, being unable to see the future, that every other character and personality in the story we've read this evening is we get to look back over 2,000 years of history and reflect upon where was Caesar and where is Christ. Jesus, even today in 2021, is the object of the most ardent worship and adoration 2,000 years. After what seemed to be a short, yet of course eventful life, the Romans put him to death, And here he stands, as history's most towering figure. In fact, as we bring this contrast to its climax, so to speak, we reflect upon the fact that in in 313 AD, Jesus, having been led in the womb of his mother to Bethlehem to be born and to be rightly registered as as a subject of Roman rule, in 313 AD, Rome itself as an empire declared itself to be entirely Christian. That means the very throne of Caesar became Jesus' throne in just 300 years. This truth is jarring. And so knowing all that, thinking through all that, processing all of that, we come back to the angelic proclamation. This is why the angels would say in Luke 2.14, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. The truth is jarring. How is Jesus able to achieve all this and yet still able to achieve all this? The answer is the simple truth of the gospel. Despite what Napoleon Bonaparte thought, 
Jesus was absolutely, truly human. But at the same time, he was also truly divine. God's eternal son, born of the virgin in Bethlehem, lived a sin-free life, went to a Roman cross to die for the sins of those who would receive him by faith. In the final analysis, let me give you one final text. Psalm chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. Psalm 2, 10 to 12. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Jesus, born in the single inn town of Bethlehem, Caesar perched as high and as mighty as a Roman Caesar would be. And in fact, this little exercise of contrast reveals that Jesus truly is Lord of all. In fact, if you'll permit me just for a moment, even reflecting upon the truth that Caesar, in all of his imperial power and rule and glory, called for a, a census, he was doing nothing other than following the very will of God. Isn't it curious? Have you ever wondered? Maybe you haven't. I have. Why weren't Mary and Joseph already in Bethlehem? Like why, why weren't they as studious in their study of the Old Testament prophetic literature to know that if Mary is born with the Messiah, the Savior, the Lord of Lord, King of Kings, that that child needs to be born in Bethlehem? We don't know the reason. The Bible doesn't tell us. But when Mary and Joseph seem to, seem to be making no plans to get to Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy, God moves the heart and the hand of Caesar to make sure that every word of Scripture proves true. And this little decree, or big decree, almost global decree as the world was known then, Jesus proves himself to still be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. After all, this was the plan all along. Heaven's King has arrived in our time and space. And Jesus did not come just to be some tribal chief of the backwater parts of Galilee but to be enthroned above all principalities and powers and rulers. Which is why the angels announced at his birth that it would be peace on earth. It is a global mission. Jesus is conquering kings and kingdoms, bringing his peace to all those who receive him. As we read earlier, we'll finalize our discussion here this evening in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Isn't this impressive? That at the birth of Jesus, knowing all of the powerful figures and emperors and kings and all else who Jesus will impress and rule over, the first witnesses to the birth of Christ were shepherds. You've heard Christmas sermons before. You've heard that shepherds were the, they were the scum of society in this day and age. It was illegal for shepherds to even give evidence in court. They were so mistrusted and despised. A shepherd could witness a murder take place and they wouldn't even be asked to come into court to bear witness to it. That's how, that's how, that's how despised they were. This is why the shepherds were out in the field. Have you ever wondered this? Where, were, where was everyone supposed to be? In their hometown getting counted, the shepherds were like, we know they don't care about us. We're just going to go and take care of our sheep out in the field. No one's even going to notice us. Missing. The angel comes and visits and proclaims this decree that the King of kings and Lord of lords has arrived. He has come to bring peace on earth and goodwill to all if we receive him by faith. It's almost like the angels burst in upon the shepherds. Shepherds minding their own business and they announce the king has come. Shepherds go to see and they bear witness to the testimony. This Jesus is Lord, is king, is the greatest of all. And history has testified infallibly to that fact. But tonight we close with this question. Do you have Jesus? Is he on the throne of your life? Is he reigning and ruling in your circumstances? 
His influence is on an upward march. And yes, Jesus is determined to have the throne of your life. He has conquered Caesars and rulers and emperors. And he's coming in love and grace and forgiveness and mercy to conquer each and every one of us. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for this chance tonight to study these well-known, well-trodden paths of Scripture, to study the birth of Christ. No mere man, no mere mortal, but King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, we know that the gospel tells us that when the Romans were tired of him, when the religious aristocracy were tired of Jesus, they had him put to death, thinking that then they'd silenced him. They'd, they'd, they'd put themselves out of the misery of this Jesus. But we know that on the third day, Lord God, by your power, he was raised from the dead. He ascended to the highest throne in all reality, the throne of glory in heaven. And from there he rules and reigns. And he calls each and every one of us to have personal relationship with him. Despite our sins, causing constantly to, to afflict us and, and bring us anything but peace. Jesus has come to bring us his forgiveness and grace. We thank you, Lord God, for this Christmas story. May it bring peace to all of us and goodwill in our lives. By your grace, in Jesus' name, amen.